Good morning, City Church. Whether you're here in Canterbury or whether you're in Whitstable, it's fantastic to be together. And if you've got a Bible, let's jump straight into God's Word. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. I want to see the rustling of Bibles or the uh, swiping of iPhones or whatever it is, wherever your Bibles are. We love the Bible. We are a Bible church. We love it passionately. And the last few weeks, we've been ha- going through the Gospel of Mark uh, under the, t- the uh, title of Reality Check, The True Cost of Following Christ. Jesus' hard-hitting words to people who say, yeah, I want to become a Christian. I want to follow you. What does that actually mean? So a few weeks ago, we started Reality Check number one. Jesus encouraged us that actually if you coast, you're toast. I, you need to be someone who gives yourself to prayer. Jesus' response to a kind of prayerlessness was tough but tender. And then two weeks ago, we had Reality Check 2, which was being a seeker isn't enough. And for the rich young ruler, it wasn't enough just to seek God. He had to give up his treasure, which was like an idol. It was something that was strangling his love for God. Um, And so again, we see Christ's response was tough, but tender. And then last week, Reality Check 3 was the whole thing of, it's not about you. Pride was the issue we looked at last week, and Christ nailing that. And again, his response was tough. But tender. Today, however, the issue that Jesus puts his finger on, we see a response that isn't just tough but tender. It is tough and terrifying. It is genuinely Jesus, you know, rated 18, X rated. This is Jesus like seriously putting his finger on something that doesn't just provoke, as it were, a kind of, you know, a tender response. There is a genuine thing that Jesus sees in the community of God that he is rightly very angry about. And we need to hear today. So with that in our mind, thinking, what on earth is it? Let's see if we can spot it from Mark chapter 11 and verse 11. Here we go. This is about Jesus. He entered Jerusalem. He went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, He found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him. But all the crowd were astonished at his teaching. And when the evening came, they went out of the city. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you have cursed has withered. Father, be Very present with us, I pray. Come and let your spirit shape our thinking. Let your word, let your word, as Jeremiah says, your word is a hammer. Let it come and do its work, Lord. Search our hearts and let us see if there is any offensive way in us. In Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Amen. So reality check four is this. Every person matters. This is a reality check about Jesus confronting something that he saw in his people where they were busy, there was lots going on, as we're going to see, but they had lost the heart of God that every single person matters. And I'm going to show that. And we're going to walk through it in three different ways. First of all, we're going to look at the problem, which was they were busy, but they were breaking God's heart. Then secondly, we're going to look at the issue underneath the problem, which was obvious, but very serious. And then thirdly, we will look at the solution, a few, which was found in God alone. So the problem, the issue, and then the solution. First of all, what's the problem? Let's just, a few moments, just spend a bit of time painting the picture so we're we're living in the time that this was was, was, uh, recorded about. He entered Jerusalem. Jesus has just come in. Prior to this, it's been an upbeat moment uh, where the palm trees are out. You know it. You've probably heard it before. Hosanna, Hosanna, he's here. Jesus is here. It's a fantastically exciting moment before this. And he entered Jerusalem. And look at this. He went into the temple. And when he looked around, he left. And and what Mark is trying to show us is that silence is deafening. 
Jesus' lack of comment on this temple is deafening. Something, something is not right. Something is not right. And you know that thing in life where you've got something on your mind and like you're now in a different situation, but it's still on your mind? You know that? Yeah, and that's what happens next. So the next day he wakes up, he's still thinking about the temple. What's going on? Was it positive, Jesus, or was it, what did he think about the temple? And we see here, the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf. Okay, so from a distance, this fig tree looks healthy. From a distance, the city church looks healthy. From a distance, fill your name in, X, Tom Shaw, looks healthy. There's a leaf, it looks healthy. And seeing in a distance of fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything. But when he found it, this, this, this phrase haunts me, all right? He found nothing but leaves. He found nothing but leaves. Now, the next bit says, for it was not the season for figs. And it's kind of confusing. Mark, why are you, why are you saying that? If, there was, if, it was, if it wasn't the season for figs, why is Jesus angry that there's no figs? Well, let me explain. This is happening around about March time, springtime. When the leaves are visible... Yes, there shouldn't have been technically fully blown capital F figs, which came later in the autumn. But there should have been what was called pagim, which was like mini figs, the beginnings of the figs. If the leaves were there, there were always pagim, which is the beginnings of figs. So actually, Jesus was right when he saw the leaf to think, great, there'll be the mini figs, there'll be the pagim, which I can go and eat, and which everybody ate way before the full figs. So the thing to focus on is this. He found nothing but leaves. He found nothing but leaves. And Jesus here, he then curses the tree. And his disciples are thinking, what is going on? A bit of an overreaction, isn't it? But what we find is he is still thinking, meditating, and actually very upset, rightly, about his previous experience the night before in the temple. Because then he goes back into the temple. And suddenly you realize what he was doing to the fig tree was symbolic. Not so much about the fig tree, but about his view of the temple. Look, this is why he says, And they came to Jerusalem, verse 15, he entered the temple, and he begins to drive out the money changers. Why? Because verse 17 tells us what it should have been like, what it would have been like if it was a place not just with leaves, i.e. busyness and appearance of activity, but if the temple was actually not just leafy but figgy, if it had fruit This is what it should have been like. Look, verse 17, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament what it should have been like. This is God himself about his temple. What words did he say? He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. So those are from a guy called Isaiah, hundreds of years earlier, quoting God's heart for the temple. It was meant to be a place that wasn't just busy, but it was bursting. It was meant to be bursting with people from all nations. The emphasis here is not so much on prayer, but on that prayer for all the nations. That there should have been a, a, a activity and a, and, a, and a deep sense that at the temple, yes, the temple was about Israel meeting with God. We all know that, okay, from the Old Testament. But what they had missed, what was so heartbreaking to God, was that always, it wasn't just about that. It was also that it would be a place of house for all the nations. It would be a place where people from different nationalities, i.e. those who weren't Christians, we might put it in those terms, That it was about a place, yes, where the Israelites could connect with God, but then the world could come in and they could go, wow, actually, is this God true? Do you see, therefore, what he's doing here when when he says this in his heart and then he looks at the temple? He's saying, you've got leaves, but no figs. You've got leaves, but no fruit. This place is, is not how it should be. And that's why you see in verse 15, he says he entered the temple. And he began to drive out those who sold and bought in the temple. The temple, since the time it was constructed, the first one, this was the third one, Herod's temple. But since it was first constructed and God laid out what it should be like hundreds of years earlier, he would always said, okay, think of this, O Israel, yes, you are very blessed because you have the presence of God. But you're going to have a welcome team attitude, not a bouncer's attitude. All right? And you've got a bouncer's attitude. Things are not as they should be, he's saying. You're like a fig tree that's got leaves on the surface of it. From the distance, it looks fine, but there is something wrong. And that fruit, okay, that fruit I am nailing you on lovingly is mission. This place should be a place where there are constant streams of people who are not Christians coming in and seeing 
the reality of God, and it's not there. And in fact, what we see is this, is that it wasn't just that, is that this area, this temple that was meant to be for a place for the world to come, actually it became a place that was really all about the needs of Israel, particularly the leaders. It's tragic. It's tragic. Look, you see, what we learn is, is the turning the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. What's that all about? Basically, if you were Gentile and you were interested in this God of Israel, you knew he was holy, yeah? So what I do is, I've, I know I've sinned, I bring in an animal, often lambs. And Jesus and God set this up, he said, it's a way of demonstrating you're serious about your sin. You bring in your best animal, and you bring it to the court Gentiles, and you'd go to a priest and go, I, I'm interested in this God of Israel, here. And, and do you know what was happening? Is they were sort of systematically going, yeah, that's not quite a good enough lamb, I'm so sorry. But you can buy one here that is definitely kosher. It's definitely good enough. Uh, yeah, it happens to be 10 times the price. Sorry about that. That was happening. It was wicked. The Gentiles were coming in. They, would pervert. they had changed it from a place that should have been all about them coming in to find out about the presence of God. And then they're using it for their own means. They had like a bureau de charge there for people who came in with the wrong coinage because they're Gentiles from different countries. And rather than just changing it, they would mark it up by 25%. They were ripping them off. So this place, which was busy, there was something profoundly wrong. It was busy, but there was no actual activity of Gentile inclusion. It was a fig tree that had the appearance of leaves, the appearance of health, but it was rotten. It was not what it was meant to be doing. And you're sitting there thinking, great, Tom, thanks for the history lesson, but we're actually in East Kent, 21st century. I don't think this is particularly relevant. Well, it is if you're part of this church. It is if you would call yourself a Christian because guess what? Reality check time. Jesus says the temple, physical building in the Old Testament, the church now is the temple. That's the people. So Jesus' view of this temple, we need to take to heart and say, Lord, how are we doing as the temple? How would you do? If you, what would his view be if he came in here? Would he say leaves but no figs? Busy but no figs. I don't know. What about this? Not just, not just the family general level. Jesus also repeatedly said, you. Paul talks about this. says, you personally are now, if you're a Christian, are the temple. So even individually, his view, are we leaves from a distance, but there's no fruit? I, mean, I find this really haunting. I do. I find this so to chill, think, God, what would you say if you looked at our church? At my, you see, we've grown so much. It's brilliant. 80% growth in 24 months. Hitting over 500 now from like 240 a while ago, two years ago. Think, That's amazing. But you know, the scary thing is this. When you're growing, you can think you're on mission. <laughs> Can't we? We can think, well, we're on mission. Do you know how many of the people who have come have been hand invited by us? Some of them have. Some of you have. Praise God. But when I think about many... Many have come as Christians. And I praise God for that. I love Christians. I'm a pastor. I like sheep. It's brilliant. But, you know, it, it really is a bit worrying because when, to be honest with you, we have on our regular alpha right now, I think four, maybe five guests in a church of over 500. That, that does worry me. And we can come up with all the excuses. I know I can hear it even in our hearts now. But guys, I know of church plants with 10 people who have 15 guests, 20 guests. The, the danger of growth is we all just think, cool, man, it's happening. It's just happening. And actually, what would Jesus say if he came? What is he saying? He's here through his word and his spirit. What's he saying to us? I can't answer that for you, all right? I can answer it for me. I think it's a loving kick up my bum. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. This is not me, I pray, in any way judging you. It is us together saying, what does his word say to us? It is something I think God wants us to help. Uh, Oswald Smith said a humorous quote, but it's very challenging. He said, Christians go on and on about the second coming, while most of the world hasn't heard about the first. It's true. Most people, 5% of people in this nation go to church. Probably half that are going to a church where it's actually born-again believers. So first of all, <sighs> the problem. That was the problem. There was leaves. There was busyness. Busy. Busy, 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 busy. What's going on? Rotors and everything. But there was no real fruit. Jesus was heartbroken. But the issue behind the obvious surface problem was actually, well, it was, it was obvious. 
I mean, I'm sure you can put two and two together and see what it is. It was obvious, but very serious. Just because it was obvious didn't mean it wasn't significant. The issue was space. <laughs> it was space. It was the fact that this, guys, there's a rule in life, isn't there, that we make space for that which we value. So if you want a good body, you go to the gym. You make space for the gym. If you value uh, your, you know, I don't know, rest, you prioritize and you make space for your holidays. If you fa value your, fa your family, you'll, you'll make space to go and see your family. Do we make space value those who do not know Christ in the way that God wants us to? Some of you will be doing this brilliantly. Praise God. Many of us aren't, I think. And I think there's two ways this works. There's space externally, practically, which we'll look at, and also space internally in terms of our souls, in terms of our hearts, making space, loving them. Start, you see, first of all, space externally. Jesus did something before he said something. He could have just said, this place is going to be a place of prayer all nations. I, this may, place should be crammed with those who aren't Christians. But he actually, first of all, did a physical act, didn't he? He was demonstrating there's a physical, practical element this place, this court of Gentiles, should actually be a place where there's a lot of space for people who don't know God to come. But it's got clogged up like an artery. It's got clogged up with stuff that Christians or the, the, the Israelites were just making about themselves. Now, I want to I prove a point here, which is I love. So, so, I'm a simple man. I like things simple. Can we have the next slide up? Now, stop right there, my friend. Good man. Now, that's, I've done my maths. Okay. The temple, the, the Jewish temple, Herod's temple that we're looking at here that was built, it had three sections that we'll just go through in a moment. And then it had around it the, um, the Gentile court, which is the thing we're talking about today. Okay? But this will help us understand something. First of all, there was the Holy of Holies. Second section of the temple was called the Court of Israel, which was the Jewish men could come. Third section was the Court of um, Women, which was where the Jewish women came. Now, stop right there. Stop. Don't press any buttons. Now... At this moment, I in my head have always thought the court of Gentiles, which is that area we're looking at where the Gentiles could come in, was like a kind of just a perimeter around it, which is kind of true. I looked at it in my ESV study Bible, brilliant purchase by the way, and I looked at various commentaries, and we can be very clear about the dimensions that this temple was, which God had asked and specified. Are you ready for this? Next slide, please. Bosh! Wow! Can I have a wow? That's a wow moment. That's amazing. So, unless I'm just the only one and I've been a bit thick, which is very possible, you've got the temple itself on the left, which was 100 yards deep by 150 yards long. The court itself was 500 yards long with 350 yards wide. That is 35 acres. <laughs> 35 acres! That's like 35 football pitches. Now, I love God. I think God has got a sense of humor. So he's like trying to make it obvious to the people of Israel, to the people of City Church, how much, do I, how much space do I want to make for those who don't know Jesus? Is it a little itsy-witsy perimeter bit? It's massive. I love it. It's so visual. I'm a visual learner, and this feeds me. This helps me. This challenges me in terms of how much God Physically. Now, this is why we've changed church in many ways. We've done things. We've changed it over the last few years. Sundays used to be about, really, they were very, we had lots of blind spots. And it was kind of just about us Christians. We all knew where the lose were. We didn't have to constantly be welcoming everyone. We, you know, we, it was kind of about us. And we felt God say to us, <laughs> I'm sending you hundreds of people every year who don't know Christ. You've got to put up signs where the lose are. You've got to explain why you're doing what you are. You can't just make this about yourselves. As much as I love you, my space, my heart, look at the size of it. So we change things, praise God. We, we, our envision, again, tonight, we're not just going to gather and worship God, although I love that. We're going to go to a pub. Why? Because God wants to make space so that those who don't know Christ can come to a place that's more their territory. That's why our small groups have changed from meeting 52 weeks of the year to 30 weeks of the year. Oh, why? So we can just have a bit of time off? And what's Sherlock? No, because at Christmas, when we break, Easter, when we break, and summer, when we break, that is when so often our neighbours, our friends and work colleagues are in holiday mode and I'm able to meet and we can go, hey, I've got space to meet you. It's, it's why we're doing this. And I love it because I feel so confident this is God's heart. You know that? I feel his heart is for this. He's, he is saying spatially, practically, 
Individually, our lives, not just at the family level, but individually, our lives need to practically make space a lot for those who don't know Christ. And this is a challenge. It is a challenge. I've had a challenge because as a church, we've got so many friends, so many brilliant friendships. How do I make space often? You know, I mean, I just a little thing like just a couple of weeks ago, Daisy was invited to a, a party. And often at parties, you, you'll find is that mum and dad just drop the kids and then go. Now, Daisy wanted me to stay, bless her. But I also felt the Holy Spirit say, I want you to stay and be there with the two or three dads who are going to be there. And I'm like, but it's Saturday. I've been with people all day. I want to be a hermit. I want to be grumpy in my shed. I just, you know, I just don't, what are you talking about? But I, I, I thought, no, this is right, you know. And, and I went, had an amazing time. And it was, there's no great, by the way, crescendo ending. Suddenly, we all in the middle of the woods were led to Christ. You know, it wasn't that. It was just me being normal, being friendly, and saying, yeah, I, yeah I'm part of a church. Yeah it's, yeah, it's not like maybe how you imagine. Actually, yeah, it's like this. And what I'm saying is it's making space. When we talk about that thing of vest and invite, yeah, vest and invite, for many of us, the next few years are going to just be investing. Yeah, you know, the average person in the UK takes four years for them to become a Christian from first meeting a Christian. So many people are very cynical about church. They think it's a bit weird, a bit wacky. And so it takes years. So for many of us, this is just a season of going, Lord, I'm not going to force things. I'm just going to start investing. I'm going to invest, invest, invest. Because actually, I can't speed this up. But we are called to invest. We're all called to plant. So it's making space practically in our lives. But the real issue even behind that issue was the issue of the heart space. You see, in verse 17, Jesus, in two sentences, lines up right next to each other the stark contrast between God's, the space in God's heart, for those who don't know Christ, and the lack of it in the church's heart, in Israel's heart. Look at here, he says, My house shall be called a house of prayer. He's quoting here from Isaiah 56. My house. I love that first word. My house. God spoke through Isaiah. He says, first things first. Don't rush over this. Every word's important. First one's very important. Whose house is this, O Israel, O city church? Whose house is this? It's mine. My house. I have particular thoughts and desires, thank you, about metaphorically the carpet and how things are done and the the. Uh, design of my house. Imagine you came home and someone had broken into your house, hadn't stolen a thing, they just replaced all the sofas and put their own special carpets down and they changed all the things on the wall really disgustingly in your opinion. You're like, what are you doing? This is my house. <laughs> How dare you move my stuff? It's my house. Thank you very much. God, he owns the church. It is his house. It is not Tom Shaw's or the elders or yours. It is his. And he is razor sharp, clear, from beginning to beginning in this book about how it should be. Okay? And if there's nothing else you remember, remember the big square. Okay? He really wants his house to be a place where it is constantly expressing his internal heart space for those who don't know Christ. Last week, we looked, didn't we, at Mark 10, 45. Remember that? That last verse, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Put it this way, the Son of Man made space to come and to serve planet Earth, to serve those who don't know Christ. God's heart has always totally yearned for those who don't know Christ. He, he doesn't start loving you when you become a Christian, if you're a Christian. He has always loved you before he made Pluto. It says in Ephesians, he set his heart before us for the foundations of the earth. God has loved us and adores and wants to know your neighbors and your friends and your work colleagues. He's always been a God who has wanted to communicate this. And even the extent that Jesus Christ himself, he becomes the temple. That's the amazing thing is that we're going to see later on is that Jesus says this temple is not working do you know what? If the temple is defined as the place where God meets man, this is not working. And so I, I am the new temple. That's how much, that's how much he profoundly has space in his heart for those who don't know Christ. That's how much. And then what we see is that is contrasted with the second part of that verse where it says, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jeremiah, he's quoting another Prophet, he's saying, you are so totally off beam. You are so hard-hearted. 
You and I are so different. You are not representing me, is what he's saying. And I hate it, is what God's saying to them. He's, I'm furious, rightly so. You are not representing my heart. And I love the people. I love them. And, and I want this temple to express that. Look at the size of the court of the Gentiles. I want that. Now, at one level, we have to understand for the Jews to make space for the nations. That was a big deal because they'd been bullied. They'd been intimidated from hundreds of years by many nations. So when God was saying, I want this part of your most precious thing in your whole nation, which is your temple, a huge part of it to be where the nations can come, I understand emotionally why it was not easy to do that and they became a basically an inward-looking people. But it doesn't excuse it. It was an issue that was obvious to do with space, but it was very, very serious. They had heard Mark 10, 45, I've just quoted, about what Jesus said the Son of Man came to serve. They hadn't heard the first verse before that, Mark 44, which is his command to say, I want you to be servants. I want you, remember we last week said, to be a slave of all. I am a slave in my heart in that sense. He's not talking about being a servant in this context to God. Remember I explained that last week, as if God needs anything. He's saying, I want in your hearts you to be like my son, who's a servant to the world. I want you, Tom, to realize you're a servant to Tomford Lane and Gray's Way, which is where you live. You're a servant to them. You're there to wash their feet. You're there to be a slave of all. I want you to have that in your heart. And as even as we read that, we go, really? Is that right? Remember the next verse. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He doesn't ask us to do anything that he hasn't first done for you and for me. He, he comes to say, look, your heart is not like my heart. There's a church in Bradford called Abundant Life. You've probably heard of it. Amazing church. And many years ago, the, the, the lead leader of the church, he said, God, just show me your eyes for this church. Are we missing something? And he felt God say, just have a look around. He looked around and he noticed that all the women had their um, their purses and their, uh, what are they called? Not bags, uh, handbags, handbags everywhere. Just, just left all around. And he felt God say, they're just, it's too safe. They think it's just their own little family get together. It's too safe. I want you to be a place where the whole of Bradford comes. It's not a safe di- dynamic. And so he actually said, he said to the church, this has got to change. And, and practically, so the internal space was made, but then practically the space was made. He then poured thousands into hiring buses every week to, to get people from the rougher estates to come in. And they came in in their hundreds. And amazing things happened. And it was wonderful. And it went from a safe little club to a very different place. And that's brilliant. And the church is trailblazing. And it's also tragic that many of the long-standing members left they left because they thought it was all about Jesus and his mission and when it really came down to it and it became uncomfortable they actually left and my heart will be that not a single person because I think God is going to be leading us this way more and more and more my deepest heart desire is that in the coming 5, 10, 15, 20 years is that yes of course God will save very respectable people brilliant he loves them as well but he will increasingly add And cause us to make space in our hearts and in our lives to reach out into and invest in people who will come and gloriously more and more. It won't be the safest place, but it will bring a joyful smile to the God of heaven who's always wanted us. So we we have to ask ourselves the question then, how are we doing on this in terms of our space in our lives practically? The issue is the fruit won't come. The fruit doesn't come unless we make space. The fruit does, does not appear. The fruit was not in the temple because they hadn't made space. And this starts in our hearts, but it also then expresses itself in our timetables and in our money and in our, in our lives, every, every aspect of us. And if you're anything like me, I'm sitting here at the end of point two thinking, I kind of feel convicted, but I feel like there's a mountain of things that come into my mind. There's a mountain of reasons as why I'm not perhaps as I should be. There's a mountain of fear and, and, and busyness and fear of apathy and fear of a, a mountain of just different things that kind of immediately I can sense in my heart as to why I'm not in the place I want to be. And this is the most wonderful thing is because we don't finish on point two. We come to verse 22 
where Jesus, knowing the issue with this people, he does diagnose it. He does heart surgery with hard-hearted people. But then he also says this, what is the solution to lives that have a mountain of reasons and issues and challenges that stop us at times from doing what we should do? Look what he says here, verse 22. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Hallelujah. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. What he says here is this. What I'm asking you to do, what I have seen in the temple, what I've seen in the people that is really wrong, busyness, but you're breaking my heart. This is the issue. You can't solve this yourselves. I didn't say you need to do more alpha courses. You need to, you need to get on your knees and, and just try harder. He doesn't say that. He lifts their gaze. After saying this is not how it should be, he lifts their gaze in mercy and tender and kindness as only Jesus does. He says that's the truth. But this horizontal mission deal, you're not going to solve just by the pea shooters of trying hard. You need to bring out the big guns of prayer. The action he gives us is prayer. The activity is prayer. But the attitude is faith praying. Not just timid, but it's a lifestyle where, yes, we face these mountains in our soul that stop us from being who we should be. That stop us from being those who we say we believe in the reality of heaven and hell. But we, at times, most of the time perhaps, don't actually operate in a way that necessarily demonstrates that. Why not? What is going on? And what he says is here, listen, don't gloss over this. Oh, I've heard this, you know. Have faith in God. It's general. What's he talking about? It's not general. It's specific. It's his gold dust to us. Prayer, but in the attitude of faith. And I think there's several mountains that I see in my soul that mean I, at times, don't have space for those who don't know Christ. First of them, the big mountain is apathy. I see it in my soul, and I hate it. I absolutely loathe it. Am I the only one? Or when I think about the fact that my neighbors, my friends, Around this area, the mums, the dads at the school gates, the majority of them do not know Christ in any way, shape or form. And I, my apathy is just a horrendous thing. Um, Oswald Smith says this, Oh, to realize that souls, precious, never dying souls, are perishing all around us, going out into the blackness of darkness and despair, eternally lost, and yet to feel no anguish, shed no tears, no no travail, how little we know of the compassion of Christ. If you in any way identify with what he's saying, please don't just switch off and think, oh well, hmm, what's for lunch? This is not right, <laughs> is what he's saying. He's saying it through, you're not meant to be in that place. That's a mountain that needs to be cast into the sea. And the only way you can move a mountain, my friends, is not by trying harder, but he's saying, God, I have faith in you. Do you see that? He doesn't say have faith in yourself. Positive mental thinking. You can do it. Yeah? With wise words, you can win people. He doesn't say that. Have faith in God. Yes, you are like that. If you're Tom Shaw, at least, you have this mountain of apathy and there should be a space in here for those who don't know Christ. And by faith, I make space through prayer and, and fixing the eyes of my heart on God. I make space daily, hourly. It keeps creeping back. No! Get back, mountain. Heal. Have faith in God is what it says. It says, again, go to war on it. Understand it's have faith in God. Focus on God. When you feel apathy in your life, it's actually it's about understanding the heart of God for this planet. It's the only remedy that will ally on us to throw that, that mountain away. Focusing on his love for those who don't know Christ. And not moving until you, you've had like a an alignment afresh, yeah? Until you're saying, look, I'm not going to leave. I'm, I'm not just going to operate. I'm saying, Lord, soften my soul. Lord, do something. Let me not be just like a, like a robot who walks around with no soul, like the tin man, you know, no heart. Lord, change me. And then step out. Because this is the reality is our boss, Jesus, 
He really cares about this. If you work in an environment with a boss, you'll quickly learn that everyone works. What's the boss bothered about? Is he bothered about time, timekeeping? In which case, you try and focus on being there on time. If your boss is bothered about budgets, it's like, get the budgets in on time. If he's bothered about morale, you're like, hey, we're all good. You find out what your boss cares about. That's what every environment's like. And then you focus on that. Listen, our boss here, he's not saying in this situation I really care about fellowship, although he does. He's not saying I really care about giving, although he does. He's saying I really, really, really care about the lost. And I know you've heard that, and I've heard that. But he's saying you can hear it and then never change. I think that's okay. And if Jesus came in here and said, you are a fig tree with leaf, but no fruit. He doesn't want that. He wants us to go, Lord. He doesn't just say you're, you're gone for. He says, listen, this is the remedy. Have faith in God. Fix the eyes of your heart on him daily. Let that apathy drain away as you fix the eyes of your heart on me and understand your boss really cares. Ephesians 2 says this. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our sins. When did God's love start for people? Does it start when they walk into a church and become Christians? That verse tells us the great love. In the Greek, it actually is the only time that phrase is used. And it kind of literally means his crazy love. But God, being rich in mercy, his crazy love for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, when you see those around who do not know Christ, you may feel nothing. God feels great love, huge love. So much love he gave his only son. If you have any doubts as to how much he loves that person, and we cannot just allow ourselves to not be that. If you are here and you're a, a non-Christian and you've met Christians before and you felt apathy towards you, I am so sorry. And I ask your forgiveness because that is not representing the heart of God. God's love burns for you. The reason you're here today is not a coincidence. It is because God wildly loves you and he created you to have a relationship with God. That is why you are on planet Earth, is to know him and to point to him and to give glory to him. So we have to be a people who understand, first of all, the mountain of apathy, which we all face, can be thrown into the sea. Second big mountain is this, the mountain of fear. Oh, it's huge, isn't it? What will they think if I talk to them and they, and they know I'm a Christian? What will they do? The mountain of fear. It's so often tied in with our own obsession with, of looking good and actually wanting their approval. And it's often an issue of authority. I don't feel like I'm in a place of authority. I feel like almost intimidated by these people. But remember, Matthew 28, some of Jesus' last words. This is a man who had died <laughs> and he came back to life. So if you want to know someone who's got authority on planet Earth, I think Jesus Christ is the man to look to. And in that place of coming back from the dead, he looked at his disciples and said, all authority has been given to me. Go and make disciples. That fills me with confidence. Would Jesus give us a command that we couldn't do? No. Would he say, go and do something that you can't do at all? No, he's saying, listen, I'm giving you authority. I've proved it by defeating the by defeating the grave. Go in my authority. Don't let fear cripple you. Say no to that mountain. Say, God, I have faith in you, God, that you're here and that you can enable me to do this. But it's a daily, hourly saying, God, Lord, this mountain that's here, Lord, let it be cast into the sea. You have to fight it. You have to say, God, don't let it be here. Every single moment, we're a split second away from either obeying God or shrinking back in fear. Every day. And the joy is, is that he can build in us, and he wants to build in us an ongoing faith in God, that that mountain less and less and less is here. And actually, there's space more and more and more for faith and confidence that today, one great pastor said, Lord, when I wake up, I say, Lord, what are you about today? And let me be part of it. It's understanding we don't have to make something happen. It's understanding that he's in control. Just a little example, I was at a gathering recently, and there was a, a guy there. I didn't know him, uh, but I knew that his daughter was having a terrible uh, time. Was very very ill, and I and I just I just felt almost this that tug of just like oh, I'll go and talk to him. I don't know him, but I just felt almost in my heart. I just felt, no, Lord, I'm going to have faith in you. I'm not going to let fear. And so I just went over to him. And there's no great massive ending again. I just went over and said, Hi, my name's Tom. I just heard about your daughter. I just, I just want you to know I'm really so sorry. I'm I'm you know. I'm thinking of you a lot, and if there's anything I can do. And this guy, kind of quite a big guy, quite a serious-looking face, to be honest with you, kind of a bit scary. 
since that moment, whenever like I now I see him, he's like honking his car, waving frantically. Hey, he's just totally changed. I've become his new best buddy. Why? Just because I planted that seed. Just planting, 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 planting the seed all the time, all the time. Not letting fear creep in. Thirdly, penultimate mountain, mountain of busyness. Mountain of busyness. You're sitting here thinking, Tom, I feel this, but you know what? I'm so nervous because I'm so busy already. Are you asking me to do more things? Listen to me. It's two things. First of all, review your existing time. Review your existing time. Who are the people that you know to some measure or to a greater or lesser extent? Are you prioritizing time? I just felt God challenged me on this practically. I sat down and thought, there's, there's several guys here that I really that don't know Christ, but they're open. Lord, let me text them. Not, not wait for them to text me. Let me text them. I mean, my evening is getting ridiculously busy. Lord, let me get them in. It's reviewing our existing time. But secondly, to make sure we've got space, because God made space. He was quite busy, actually, sustaining the universe. But he made space to come. And if you're a Christian, to come and to give you faith in his son. But secondly, it's not just reviewing existing time. It's also using, really using, capital U, using your time every day. You see, and my wife always says this. She says, God will do so much with just so little. If we just do a little bit of Lord today, Holy Spirit, wh- where, wherever I am, Lord, are you wanting me to just, uh, he will do so much, won't he? With such a little amount, a tiny little act of obedience. Just a friend of mine was just saying recently, a couple of nights ago, he was just in Pret-a-Manger having a nice time to himself. And he just suddenly overheard this couple, two guys rather, talking about life and death and we had both atheists and he he was like, oh no, Lord, I'm pretty busy. I'm only here for a little bit of time. And he just felt like, come on, faith in God, faith in God. And so he just, he just said, guys, sorry to interrupt, just to say my ex. And uh, have you heard of Alpha? It's this great course. And he just, and they didn't say, oh yeah, let's come. But he was there diligently listening to what the Spirit was saying. He was using the time that God had gave him. God has placed you in in wonderful positions that are unique and specific. And he's not saying, right, now just give up all your jobs and just walk around everywhere necessarily. He's saying this, wherever you are, to always be thinking that business is not actually, it's not a mountain that should block you from being hugely effective in his hands. Mother Teresa said, don't worry about the numbers when you think about all those who don't know Christ. Don't worry about the numbers. She said this, she said, just love one person one at a time. I'll start with the person nearest you. Uh, D.L. Moody, a guy from the past, an amazing preacher, he said this. He said, if I can get a man to talk about, think about death for just five minutes, I'll win him every time. I'll win him. He's just saying it doesn't take long. He said, it's true. It's true. If you're someone and you just step out. You know, this. I found this hugely encouraging. Eric Harmer, who leads Barn Evangelical Church, great church in Canterbury, he recently said to his church, guys, you're all busy, I know that. And you're thinking, oh, it's just a bit overwhelming. Hey, listen, if you just said, let's, let's believe to see one person, us eat, lead one person to Christ every three years. That's not exactly kind of revival, is it? Let's be honest. One person each every three years. Do the maths. Okay, we're a church over 500 now. Let's say 400 adults who are definitely, you know, alive and ready to go. So if we all led one person to Christ every three years, let's do the math. First three years, we go from four to 800. Next, in six years, we go from 800 to 1,600. In nine years, we go from 1,600 to 3,200. In 12 years, you go from 3,200 to 6,400. And in 15 years, you go to 12,800 people. Only by us each leading one person to Christ every three years, and then that person doing the same. Just imagine if Barton Evangelical Church see that happen. Just imagine if City Church, just imagine if Tankerton Evangelical and St. Alfred's and Vineyard and SMB and all the churches across it. Just imagine if we started to actually go one person every three years. Come on, let's do this. This isn't like we can often think, oh, it's just overwhelming. There's so many. Yes, there are lots. But you do the maths and you realize that actually we can see massive impacts. If we say, God, I'm going to use my time. Busyness mustn't clog our faith in this. And finally, the final mountain is this, the mountain of hurt. And that's why he finishes here. When you stand praying, forgive. You think that's a funny thing to end with. But actually, guess what? The, the, the Christians that he was talking, that Mark the gospel was sent to, were Christians in Rome. 
And Christians were persecuted. They were set alight to. They were used as torches. And so he knows that a huge, a huge mountain that we can have that stops us at times from really being on mission can be the mountain of hurt. And he says, don't let that happen. Don't let the fact that you can get hurt by people when you, when you maybe share within the gospel and they feel they reject you and they talk about you and they, they really are not nice. Or even maybe family members, you've grown up who have done awful things perhaps and you think, the idea of me sharing my faith with that person. He says, listen, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But if this final mountain, if you allow that final mountain not to be there, but to say, God, I have faith in God, which means this, I remember I am first of all a forgiven one. I'm a forgiven one. Roy Lezin said this. He said, if our primary need as people on earth was information, God would have sent an educator. If our primary need was technology, he would have sent a scientist. If our primary need was money, he would have sent an economist. But God sent his son because our primary need was forgiveness and we needed a saviour. When we understand that we are, as Christians, primarily forgiven ones, it means that even that mountain of hurt, where we feel someone is so hurt, even that won't stand in the way. When we realize how much grief we cause the heart of God, and yet he forgave us, it's profound. That, that really means there's nothing that can stop a church like that. It's like a juggernaut. There's no mountain that can get in the way. If that one can really go, then, then anything can happen. And I finish with the story to prove it. Chuck Colson, American pastor, works in prisons a lot in America had this 18-month discipleship program for prisoners who became Christians. At the end of it, they'd have a big celebration where everyone would come in and they'd celebrate the progress they'd made. And there was one guy who, who, um, who was in prison, I think for 15, 20 years, for killing a 20-year-old girl. He was a non-Christian. He would always deny he did it, but everyone knew he'd done it. Several years in, he, he met Chuck and he became a Christian. And he realized he had to admit that he did this. And he admitted that he killed this, this 20-year-old girl who murdered her. Anyway, on the day of his graduation celebration, what was so stunning was, as he stood up and talked about Christ and how much he changed, there in the crowd was a middle-aged, stately-looking woman who was the mother of the daughter that he had killed. And what Chuck found out was that she had found out who this guy was. And she said, Lord, first give me the grace to forgive him, but then I pray you forgive him, Lord. Please save him. And her prayers, like arrows to the very throne room of God, she was doing this. She was saying, I'm not going to let that mountain, that one man who is the least on planet earth I want in my emotional sense to become a Christian, he needs the love of Christ. And I'm going to need a miracle, Jesus, to, to pray for him. But Lord, I pray as I'm a forgiven one, Lord, I pray forgive him. And she just prayed and she prayed. And guess what? I wonder if it's a coincidence he became a Christian. But what's so amazing is this, is when he stood up there, when he finished, she got to her feet and she went over to him and she put her arm around him and said, this is my adopted son, the murderer of her daughter. And that is totally beyond comprehension how she could do that unless she understood this. That is a woman on mission. That is a woman who understood every person matters, including the murderer of my daughter. And that isn't due to her, that's due to her, I'm sure, saying, I had faith in God. My focus in life was on God. It was about him and him transforming and doing a supernatural thing in my soul. Do you know, as we look to the future as a church, I am so excited. But do you know what? We're going to require daily, hourly, mountain-moving people. It's going to require that. Do you know, it's not a surprise that the enemy hates. He hates an advancing church. That's why mission is hard and we have to say, God, move these mountains. Let's pray, shall we? Lord. Lord, Lord, I thank you you're here. I thank you you're here, God. And I pray for us, Lord. And we will give an account to you, Lord. Every single one of us. And I pray, Lord, Father, you're so kind, you're so tender. You didn't give up. On these people, you gave them the solution. You gave them the key. You said, listen, have faith in God. Focus on God. Fix the eyes of your hearts on him. And you will know an extraordinary ability to throw mountains into the sea. I want to pray for us, Lord. In a moment as we come to break bread, as we think about your body literally broken for us. Lord, you came because you had space in your diary 
to save us. You should have just been with the angels in heaven, with all of heaven loving you. And you looked on this little ball of dust that was filled with rebels, God-haters, and you said, I have such space in my heart, I'm going to send my only beautiful son, who is the only one who could pay the price. And I want to pray that we will be a people who, at the very core of our being, will absolutely, Lord, we will just represent you with never-ceasing intensity, Lord. Your deep love. I want to pray, Lord, as we have mountains. Even now, if there's mountains in your heart, just, just before we stand and worship and as we break bread, even now, just, just ask God. Say, God, fix the eyes of my heart on you. That I would, in faith, move this mountain and step out. Lord, I pray if there's any mountains here, mountains of apathy or fear, or busyness, or hurt. I pray, Lord, please. I pray if there's any almost wounded people here today, Lord, and, and in many ways their Christian life's not bad, but there's something missing. It's because actually you're not on mission. You're not actually on mission. And God loves you, and he's not condemning you. He's highlighting it so you can, as of this day, say, God, I'm not going to let others just be those that bring people I want to lead the charge. Lord, I've only got a brief moment on this earth. Lord, I pray, let us totally be in line, emotionally, practically, with your huge space in your heart, the immensity of your heart for the lost. In Jesus' name, amen.